Hello and welcome everyone to this webinar which is being delivered in partnership with the UK's Health and Safety Executive on their recently launched Asbestos and You campaign. My name is Louise Hosking and I'm the IOSH Immediate Past President. I will be your host for today's session. Asbestos has been very prominent again recently. Earlier this month, we promoted Global Asbestos Awareness Week, held by the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organisation and supported by IOSH. This initiative raises awareness about the dangers of asbestos and how to prevent exposure. This also coincided with the launch of the HSE's Asbestos A New campaign. During this session, we will not only delve into more detail on the HSE campaign itself, but also address the risks that continue to be associated with asbestos, particularly in younger workers. This is an area of work which I have been significantly involved in personally, ever since the start of my early career when I worked in retail and then went on to oversee risk in residential and commercial property. Back in 2018, in support of our own occupational cancer campaign, No Time to Lose, IOSH conducted a survey which found that nearly one in four UK construction workers believed they had been exposed to asbestos fibres. Meanwhile, worldwide, past asbestos exposure claims well over 107,000 lives a year with an estimated 125 million people still being exposed annually. These statistics are truly shocking, and yet there still seems to be a perception that form, perception forming that asbestos is something of the past, something which only affects the older generation who worked with asbestos before the ban in the UK in 1999. To date, Asbestos has been banned in well over 60 countries, but many buildings constructed prior to these bans still contain it, which means that there's still a potential risk. So an instant question comes to mind here. Exactly what causes this perception and how can we challenge this to sort the facts from the perceived fiction? Well, today I have with me an excellent panel who will seek to address just that, amongst other things. And during these sessions, we will be launching some polls so that you can get involved. So I have very great pleasure in introducing our panel today. First up, we have Archie Mitchell of the Health and Safety Executive. Archie is the head of asbestos unit with the HSE and has worked as a regulator there for 30 years. For the last 10 years, he has headed the HSE's asbestos unit, which was formerly known as ALU or ALU, the unit that regulates businesses that carry out the highest risk asbestos removal work in the UK. Within his role, Archie also chairs the HSC Asbestos Industry Liaison Group and the Asbestos Network, which seeks to improve workplace standards to reduce the risk from asbestos. Welcome, Archie, and thank you for joining us today. And we also have um, one of Archie's colleagues in the um, Q&A box, Jenny, and she's going to be answering questions where we can. Next, from our very own IOSH Construction Group, we have Nathaniel Chalakoum. As well as a chair of the Construction Group Committee, Nat is also Group Health, Safety, Quality and Environmental Manager with Barnwood Limited, a major regional construction company based in Gloucester in the UK. A Chartered Safety and, a chartered safety and Occupational Health Professional and established within the construction industry for 20 years, Nat started within site management, working for clients and principal contractors before moving into health and safety. So welcome Nat. And finally, although I know that he's, he may be hot footing it any minute now, um, we have Liam Bradley. 
Liam is a site technician for Belder Black Roofs, but he is joining us today very much in a personal capacity. I'm not going to go into the full details of Liam's story um, right now because we will cover that in the session. And we will also add a link to his story in the chat box. Liam was just 30 years old when he was diagnosed with pleural mesothelioma back in February 2017. Shockingly, the reason for his exposure is still not known, and Liam has never actually shown any symptoms at this point. The only reason it was located was due to an injury which resulted in an x-ray which then identified his right lung as being 50% collapsed. This led to his diagnosis which, diagnosis which has turned Liam's world completely upside down. His story really is an incredible one and I'm grateful to him for joining our panel today. So that makes up our panel. Um, but before we go on to um, talk to the panel and start our discussions, I'm firstly going to hand over to Archie, who is going to lead us through a short presentation on the HSE's Asbestos and You campaign. And this will help to set the scene for the session. So um, if I could ask the other panel members to close their videos down, and I'm going to hand over to you. Archie, so if you'd like to um, share your screen, um, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Louise. I will just do that right now. Hello, everyone, and uh, particularly fellow IOSH professionals. So HAC has launched a campaign on the 6th of March, aimed at informing constructions of work workers about the risks of asbestos. And you can see there, called Asbestos and You. And just go into the reasons why we are doing that, because this asbestos is not a new issue in around the world and in the UK. So 5,000 people a year still die from asbestos related diseases in the UK. And asbestos can still be found in any building built or refurbished before the year 2000. I think it's important to remember that because asbestos containing materials were used extensively in the construction and maintenance of buildings in Britain from the 1950s until they were banned in 1999. So in effect, any building before 1999 has a risk of asbestos being present. And that means that tradespeople who work in those older buildings could still be exposed to asbestos fibres today. And if they don't know how to manage the risk safety, they will be at risk. Through the campaign, we want to raise awareness of the risks of asbestos and what workers and the construction industry can do to avoid those risks. And just to give you an idea of the, the scale, there are about 1.4 million construction workers in total in Great Britain. But those workers who are most at risk are typically those that disrupt the fabric of buildings, those older buildings. Demolition, electricians, joiners, plumbers, roofers, IT installation, heating engineers, glazing, etc., etc. And that's just a small part of the many trades that will be involved in disrupting the structure of a building when they're being renovated or demolished. And just to reflect back on the, the, the webinar title, Lurking in the Shadows, to give you an, an idea, this is an illustration of the scale of asbestos fibers. Asbestos fibers are not visible to the naked eye. This is an illustration of asbestos fibers against human hair. They are tiny. So while work on asbestos containing materials can release asbestos fibers into the air and be breathed, they won't be visible to those they affect. People may see dust, but they won't be seeing asbestos. Asbestos fibers in the air are really, really small. And for those of those who really with a technical interest, these are amosite fibers and very straight, short fibers. And the question, where can asbestos be found? 
it is in multiple parts of buildings. So I've given you some pictorial illustrations here. The big and obvious ones that many people see, asbestos cement sheet roofs, extremely common and still prevalent in Great Britain and around the world. Places like building structures on the right there, you see asbestos uh, insulating board ceilings. Again, extremely common around the world, um, particularly in the vintage that we're talking about. And many people will recognize those in, in many institution buildings that you will see. And then there are the ones that you don't see or would not be obvious. So on the picture on the left there, just above the asbestos sign, and obviously someone had to identify that, there are packers, small bits of asbestos put there by the building workers who were installing it. They're not part of the formal structure of the building. They're there to perhaps prop up a window to the right height for it to be installed. And they will not be visible when you're working on them. So if someone breaks into that area to fit something new, to make a change, to change the glazing, it will not be obvious. So the second part about locking in the shadows is not just about the small size of the asbestos fiber. It is where asbestos is fitted. It is in the walls, roofs, insulation, floorings, flues, pipes of buildings. It's that domestic, commercial and industrial premises. There are estimates that there may be over 3000 different known asbestos containing products. And that, that's just a conservative estimate. So the reason we're going through this campaign is because we have looked at past research. With what the construction workforce, we know there is a broad work knowledge in the industry, in the workforce, of the dangers of asbestos. And workers are generally aware of the importance of not disturbing or working with asbestos. However, I think realistically there is a disconnect. And the other part of our research is that when asked, a very common feature is that people think or tradespeople in the construction industry think exposure to asbestos is not a risk to me and to my work. And it's that disconnect we want to address because people also think I do not think there is a personal health risk to me when asked. And finally, we also get the response back in research. People think it is not my responsibility to check or take action in my work. And those are the factors that give lead to a risk of exposure. While it's all very well knowing that asbestos exists and that it might be present, and as a general point, there is a disconnect. So one of the key points we wish to get across is to workers is how to be safe. And workers need to think about things like is the building built before the year 2000, if you work in Britain? Is there a survey or management information about where asbestos is? And workers and their managers should be asking for that and expecting to get information. If you're gonna be working on a structure of building, all those trades I talked about before, you need to get trained. Any trade, that's going to disrupt the, the fabric of a building needs training. And ultimately, despite all that information, if the construction worker is looking at an area and they come across a suspicious material not covered by the survey, they need to stop work. They need to question that, that material before they disturb it. And the, that's why we think there is a particular risk when it comes to younger people, because they are a generation that the installation of asbestos was stopped before they even in, entered the construction industry. So their experience is very different to those who were around when asbestos materials were installed and their experience and understanding is different. And finally, I'd invite anyone who come to, to the Asbestos and You website, and we have our quick trade guides, our quick guide for trades, where people can get further information. Campaign will be running for three months until May, 
in which we will evaluate the, the campaign at that stage. We also partnered up with On The Tools. It's a media partnership and an online uh, uh, media uh, broadcaster. They have a mini documentary and a day in the life film. And we will share the links to that. We're also partnering with Dusons, a trade supplier in Great Britain, to provide materials. However, anyone on this call is very welcome to share our campaign materials. We do want to achieve maximum reach around the country and get to the maximum number of people who might be at risk from asbestos. So I'll halt at that point. Thank you very much, Louise. Thank you. So um, thank you so much, um, Archie, for that introduction to the campaign and for really starting to set the scene for us quite nicely for this session. So I'm going to invite Nat and Liam um, back onto the screen um, and um, I'm going to jump straight into some questions. We have some preset questions with with um, We've got 925 people on the call and rising. And so there are questions coming through in the chat box, um, but we're gonna start with some um, preset questions. Um, and I'm gonna give Archie a bit of a short breather to start off with um, and come to you first of all, Nat. Um, so off the back of Archie's introduction to the Asbestos and You campaign, UK law contains requirements in respect of a duty to manage. Can you just start by talking about that? What exactly does it mean and what it what is what is it meant for your role as well? How have you got involved with that? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Louise. Um, so yes, uh, duty to manage. Uh, in the UK, um, under the, uh, the control of asbestos regulations, um, there is a specific duty um, on owners of, of properties to manage asbestos if it is present. Um, so duty holders such as uh, owners, occupiers and, and, and managing agents uh, have to assess whether asbestos uh, or asbestos containing materials, uh, otherwise known as ACMs, uh, is or suspected to be um, present um, in non-domestic premises. Um, so the duty holder must determine you know, the risk posed by asbestos of the OCMs um, and um, on their premises. And the first step for this uh, is to complete a survey. Um, so you know exactly you know, what, what you're dealing with. Um, this is usually a, a management survey, but if you're taking uh, refurbishment work or, or construction work, um, then a, uh, a refurbishment and demolition survey is to be uh, undertaken. And then using those surveys, um, you can uh, put together a written plan um, that must be prepared then and then identifies the areas of, of concern and the necessary control measures uh, that are needed. Um, and, um, you know, uh, both, both you and I have experience of working on refurbishment projects. Um, and, um, you know, one of the first things that we always ask for is a, uh, an R&D survey, that refurbishment and demolition survey um, from the landlord or the landlord's agent. Um, so we know exactly before the job starts um, what uh, is uh, present in the building. And um, following the R&D survey, um, which, you know, must be destructive, it must go into all areas of the scope of works and must take um, into account, you know, behind walls and ceilings and everything like that, um, must detail, you know, what's present. And from that, you know, we can decide, hopefully, to remove that asbestos. So before our site teams get in there, we know that our asbestos has been removed. Wow, that's an excellent summary of the duties. <laughs> um, just to, um, before we um, move back to Arch again, um, it's worth stressing that the survey and the plan are two different things, aren't they? Correct, yes. Just talk about that a bit more now. Certainly. So either your management survey or your R&D survey, yes, um, must must you know do that first so you know exactly you know what you've got and then from that you can put together your asbestos management plan um, which will detail you know what type of asbestos you've got um, what condition it is in um, and uh, you know the, the likelihood of risk and how harmful it can be and how you can control on that and that's where the management plan comes in it details the control measures um, that, that you will take um, as a duty holder. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks very much. So um, I'm going to come back to um, 
you again now, Archie, and then we're going to um, go on to speak to Liam. So, Archie, the title of this women, webinar is Lurking in the Shadows, um, the truth about asbestos. And, and, you know, as you outlined within your presentation, we can't visibly see it, we can't smell it, we can't feel it. Um, so what type of asbestos containing materials do you think we should be most concerned about? Um, and, you know, whereabouts are we get, uh, most likely to find those types of materials? I think the, the, the thing is with buildings in the right age, asbestos was almost everywhere. And I think the presumption has to be that you look at a building and you think it's an enormous number of places. So in real terms, you know, the biggest best of cement sheets that it showed before, roofs, gutters, downpipes, it was walls and it is in walls, ceilings, classically the, the textured ceilings in, in domestic premises, behind electrical panels, boilers, exterior soffits, floor tiles, roof tiles, even the adhesives. Um, and the, there are ones like the higher risk materials, like lagging materials and sprayed coatings. In the United Kingdom, we talk about licensed material. That's what my team and I work with. And those are the highest risk materials. The, the, they generate the most fibers when they are disturbed. Equally, the lower risk materials like the asbestos cements and the floor tiles and so on. Asbestos is held in a matrix there, but the kind of works we're talking about here by construction are involved in disturbing the building, disturbing materials, drilling holes and so on. They will generate fibers. So the risk for a worker is multiplied by the fact that they will repeatedly in the course of their working life carry out these activities unless we take the precautions we're going to be exposed multiple times so there isn't um, while there is asbestos everywhere and there are undoubtedly higher risk materials which there's a significant precautions required to work with and there's lower ones which other people can with the right training the risk is still high and asbestos is present almost everywhere in older buildings, not in every building everywhere, I should emphasize, but it can be present in great many places. And I think that's the point with the younger workers is a generation ago knew or saw that material being put in. A younger generation has not seen that happen. And it's and it's worth sort of saying is that, you know, if we think about that lagging, which, you know, can be the most, you know, if that's been installed back in the 70s, it's going to be deteriorating now, isn't it? Yes. And that's, that's the thing is in terms of the, the management point that Nat made is that there will be a great deal of difference between materials. So some materials will be held up in, in, and in still in very good condition, painted over multiple times, and they will be generating very little risk if undisturbed. And it's part of that management plan that Nat was talking about, taking active decisions uh, about as a business who own a property or manage a property about how they want to manage that risk with asbestos. And I think the other point to make, I think for the, that um, I'm Nat and I'm sure you've come across before, is it makes a big difference to the costs for a business if they start on a project and they identify asbestos once they're into the project, it makes a massive difference if they then have to pause and there's quite a set up time and statutory requirements about removing that asbestos safely. So from a business point of view, never mind the safety one, there's a big impact in not having the information at the point of building. And we're looking for both the designers and the property owners to be thinking about that at the stage before work starts. Absolutely, that's a really good point, and I've seen that happen many a time. So, um, Liam, um, welcome for um, joining. Welcome to the panel. Um, just thinking about Archie's response there. 
um, there will be a lot of people out there who believe that they may have been exposed to asbestos. Um, and when we ran a No Time To Lose survey um, prior to um, lockdown, we certainly discovered that as well. We saw that. Um, so Liam, thinking about your own experience, um, what would you say to those people who could be concerned and, and perhaps you can share some of your story as well? Um, <clears throat> hi, everyone. Um, in terms of people potentially being exposed, um, but unknowingly, but just sort of asking that, that, that big question mark over the head as to whether they have or not, um, I think it's just asking, you know, just trying to ask the right questions. Um, I mean, I, I see it every single day, still to this day. I was on a project this morning at work and it was a really old building and it was absolutely riddled with, not not it wasn't forced to be, but the a lot, there was alarm bells ringing everywhere I walked. So I just, I just came, I just didn't even bother going in. I didn't, didn't, didn't even go on the roof. Um, and I get laughed at a lot for that. Um, but they don't realise my story of, I was only 30 when I was diagnosed. Um, and that was, I, I, I think I'm really lucky. Because um, my, my diagnosis came from, from an accident, from falling off a three-storey building. Um, and I had to have an operation and that's where they, where they found it. And luckily it's really, um, it's really small and it's not grown for seven years. Well, it's not grown at all. Um, so touch wood, it carries on that way. Um, but I mean, my brother's a roofer and my brother, we've worked on sim same projects together in the past. And even he worries, like, because he, is, he, he probably has come in into contact with asbestos and you don't have to, unfortunately, you don't even have to go to work to be in contact with it. And for me, I just think we need there's no there's no testing for it you can't just go for a scan to be tested for it it's just you get symptoms it's too late uh, luckily for me i was diagnosed a, a lot i still haven't got any symptoms um i'm still i still live my life as normal um so it, i don't know really how to answer that question in terms of uh, what what you would what what sort of I, I wouldn't even know what to say to anybody if they're concerned because i don't think there's a lot out there if I'm honest, I could all I can all I would suggest is just get information on sort of the materials that you're working with if it is in a workspace, um, and ask the relevant questions like a, an asbestos survey. There should always be an asbestos register on on certainly on, on a construct on a refurbishment construction site. Uh, there should be whether there is it or not is a different um, a different an different answer. But um, yeah, it's. It's a tough one, that one. Yeah, it's, it's sort of it getting in contact probably with your GP and and you know, yeah, make a yeah. I mean, if, if you've got if you feel if you've got symptoms, like I was listening, I was on BBC One this morning um, on a program called Connell Cure, um, and there was another I mean, there was another patient, and she had really bad chest pains, so um, she went to the doctor. And the last thing that she thought that she was she had got was mesothelioma, you know. Um, and people don't even know what it is. They still, people still think it's an old wives' tale. Um, and the only reason I knew about mesothelioma is because I'm the fourth person in my family to be diagnosed with it. Um, they've all passed on now. They were a lot older, than, a lot older than me. But um, so I had a bit of an understanding from it, um, but still learning every day. So I, I'm really interested um, with the fact, I mean, obviously you're, you're going to be hyper aware now, um, but if, um, you know, there's going to be tradespeople listening to this call today um, and, you know, you want to get in there and get the job done and do what you've got to do. You might have a client, you might have pressure, um, you know, for those people on the call that are, potentially in that situation what would be your advice just stop what you're doing the amount of times that i just walk off a building off a roof because i still work within the industry 
Um, and if people question me why you're doing it and I tell them and then they're like, and to be quite honest with you, 90% of them will just walk off and go, right, fair enough, we'll stop. You've got to, end of the day, it's not just yourself you've got to think about. You've got to think of, if you're, if you're, if you're interfering with uh, a material on a building site that contains asbestos, you're not only putting yourself in danger, but you're putting your family in danger as well. Um, and that's the way I see it. Um, so I just tell them to stop and, You've got, you know, you've, you're within your rights to stop what you're doing. It's, it's a health hazard. It, it's, it, it, you're putting yourself at risk. Um, they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't expect you to uh, work at height without wearing a safety harness. So why should they expect you to, you know, tamper and interfere with an aspect, a product that contains asbestos? Yeah, no, and we only know it's there if we test it. So you you know going back to this you know you can't see it you can't feel it you can't yeah you don't know that it's there no I, I think really certainly from me being in my in the industry that I am I'm in the construction and roofing industry you sort of get an idea of what I mean I didn't realise until a few until a few months ago that it's in it's in the in the old lead lined windows it's actually in the in the rope and stuff like that so any old window or roof lantern i just don't go near it and i assume that everything contains asbestos and i'm just i mean it's a bit late for me but it's not too late for my to, for, you know my three young children or my wife or anybody else that I, you know friends that i come in contact with sort of thing so yeah i just assume <laughs> no thank you for that um so yeah i mean asbestos is is definitely present in hundreds of thousands of buildings um, certainly in the UK alone um, and you know it's a similar tale around other countries and we know that there's other countries where you know it's still in use it hasn't actually been banned um, so we know there are risks from um, removals which can be you know very challenging even with the highest of standards of surveys we don't always know where it's located so exactly as Liam's just said um, you know, you could have a really detailed survey, but still uncover asbestos. So um, I'm going to come to you, first of all, Archie, in respect of that. Um, what can be done to improve how we manage this risk um, where that's the case? And certainly, you know, from your experience, you know, what could we be doing more of? You're on mute. Thank you. And um, I think the the first and foremost is is about that education, so that workers know exactly. Liam was describing there about workers knowing, and managers knowing. I think that that's the the first and foremost thing. Um, great many people on this call may think you know they already know, and that's that's absolutely right. But I think the the, the challenge is for younger workers, for each generation of workers is that information. I think that's really important. And that is, I think, one of the key areas by which we can influence the next people. I think the other part is the information flow. Those people that Nat pointed out who own and manage buildings, they have information and there is little point in them having the information that needs to go to their decision-making about what they do with their buildings because they can avoid running pipes and things through asbestos areas that you know designers can do that but equally they can also choose to pass that information on to the workforce who are in the businesses that are going to do that activity and I think that's really key because there's little point in generating the surveys and so on without getting the information to the front line so those are those are key points I think in terms of the act what we need to happen yeah, thank you for that. Um, and, and I'm going to start um, coming to the questions in the chat box now. Um, and Nat, somebody's asked a question um, regarding the asbestos management plan. Um, and they're asking, should the survey be part of the asbestos management plan? And, and I'm going to add to that and say, you know, what happens if you have, you know, you're responsible for you know as you are in your role for a number of different buildings would you have one plan how, how, how do you work all of that 
Yeah, it can often be confusing. Um, and I think uh, certainly if you're in a, a, an older office building or something or something like that, and just you, you happen to be able to look after the premises, then I would certainly get a, a, a your plan up together by doing the management survey first. So um, get somebody in who, who is accredited, who is a um, competent asbestos surveyor in and get them to check around uh, the building for you. They will know what they're looking for. They will know what to get tested. Um, and um, what will happen is that this firm will go around and take samples of anything that is suspicious and get that sent off to a lab. Um, and then the lab results will be able to detail um, exactly you know, um, what you've got. And then that that forms part of your risk, risk your register, your asbestos register, um, and that that and you can then incorporate that into your management plan. So from the surveys, um, basically you can put together your management plan, and then de de depending on you know the types of asbestos you've got, the condition they're in, the areas where they are, you can then use. Um, that that served the results of the survey um, and then detail with with the rest of the management team on, on what you're going to do. So are you going to leave it there? Are you going to encapsulate it or are you going to uh, remove it? And each time you make a change, you need to be updating, updating your plan. Um, so any anything that is changing, you know, in, in your building, then you need to update that management plan. And as we said before, if you're doing any re refurbishment in your building, or if you're doing any 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 demolition, then you need to be doing the R and D survey, which is a lot more intrusive. And then once the works have taken place, update your management plan again. So you've got to be thinking this is a live document. It's got to be shared with people coming into the building, contractors all the time, um, and that they are they are aware of it. And um, yeah, it's one of those documents that you should keep on constantly, keep checking, referring to it, and updating all the time. Thanks. Um, and Liam, I'm going to come to you next. Um, so David Wharton um, has asked, um, the warehouse where he works has been known to contain asbestos within the roof. Um, could you, um, you know, speak to David and say, you know, what kind of paperwork, what kind of assessments might be required from the landlord? Well, uh, well in my experiences, I mean, because my my exposure was from a factory roof um and there was no asbestos register we weren't even aware that it was asbestos until after we'd done done the work um so there should be an asbestos register there and it should it should indicate that you know well as other people have said you know where, where it's all located um with with it being on the roof i mean you shouldn't you shouldn't be jet washing it you should, if any works are carried out on that roof it should be a trained asbestos person not just a a, a roofer or a, a window fit or anything like that um and all the works that i would i'd like like to think that everybody would be made aware of of the works being carried out if any um i mean an old an old asbestos roof if it is a roof if, if that's what he's, he's referring to it's I mean, even a really bad wind, because um, them them bolts that uh, them ring bolts that are holding that on, they, they they'd have corroded over time, um, and there'll be there'll be slight movements, and you only have to have one little chip, um, and there's no such thing as a safe amount of asbestos. So, um, I would be looking for the asbestos. I'd be going straight there and asking for the asbestos register, and and just seeing what procedures they've got in place for it, because. It shouldn't really be there, not in 2023. I mean, I'm a big firm believer of prevention is better than cure. So why why have it there if, if it don't need to be when it can be safely removed and replaced with a um, a much better non-life-threatening material? No, thanks for that. Um, so I'm going to come to um, Tim Darry Layers has asked an excellent question in the Q&A box. 
um, and he says he teaches in the auto industry. Um, and this is a question for Archie. Um, do you know the extent that asbestos is appearing in the automotive automotive environment? And and I know that there was the the ban in respect of automotives in the in, certainly in the UK was slightly later, I believe. Um, if we're importing cars from around the globe, is there a potential risk, particularly if those countries don't have the same requirements as, as we do? OK, well, I can I can assure straightforwardly that the ban on putting building, putting materials into buildings in the UK all supplies to import of any forms of asbestos. Um, there are very, very, very rare and specific situations where ships have been brought into the UK to be broken up, but under specific controls and known. It is very, but you cannot bring materials into the UK containing asbestos now. Um, they, they, there are only rare exceptions. So, so auto, uh, um, automobiles, no. Um, if you have a vintage vehicle, then potentially, but they are again very rare. All the replacement parts now uh, are all non-asbestos containing. So unless you have a very old, like a very old building uh, of a car that's already been in this country, in terms of the buildings, it applies exactly the same as any other business or commercial or industrial property. Yes, they might have asbestos within the within the structure of the building um, and that is exactly as Nat described is is you know and and Liam said as well is is having that management plan identifying where the asbestos would be managing it and managing how you're going to address that in the coming years and exactly I would pick up Liam's point from before there will come a time when actually the asbestos is not in a safe state because it is aging and if that is an area where people work and that app or or live, then then asbestos has to be removed. It's the, that's that's the key message. But no, asbestos is not allowed to be imported into the UK. It is specifically prohibited. That's, um, thank you for that. Excellent. And and Michael Corliss has, has asked a similar question um, about um, the fact that he worked in the motor vehicle trade in the seventies. And I've heard this story as well, where um, brake linings contained asbestos containing materials. Um, and engineers would use airlines to blow off the linings when cleaning. So that's certainly um, potentially a, a route that has been a route for exposure in the past. Um, and coming back to yourself, Nat, so we've got quite a few questions coming in around um, surveys and scopes of work. Um, and, you know, so often, um, you know, people could be managing um, asbestos risk in building projects um, and it doesn't get identified even when they've done a refurbishment and demolition survey. Um, so um, Donald McLeod is, is asking a very specific question around this, saying there are areas missing from the survey, but the client still thinks there is no asbestos. Um, so, so Nat, can you perhaps um, respond to that? Sure. Um, well, I think many of us who, who are in the refurbishment industry, you know, come across this all the time. Um, and uh, there are so many variables. What I have found is that um, getting involved early doors and sharing the, the scope of work uh, with the um, people who are going to undertake the survey you know is is, is really key and often it's sometimes the client who, who who undertakes the survey and gets the survey company in first before say a principal contractor or a contractor comes in so you're you're often given this survey and what i would say to the the person leading that project is is check that survey check it against your scope of works um, and if you're finding that areas and rooms um basically have been missed then then, then certainly challenge it um, it is going to be more you know costly um, to to long-term you know health of people and you know to the cost of the project you know if if items get missed and yes they do get missed um, and basically they sometimes get missed because you know you're working in a live building so people they don't go in and and take apart walls and, and look into ceiling voids and everything else like that but you know as 
um, diligent contractors, you, you ought to try and, you know, challenge that survey, you know, as much as possible, go into it in detail. And if you can get into it early doors, um, then do. And the other thing is, you know, if you have a, um, uh, a refurbishment and demolition contractor that, you know, works well and you found that it has done very good surveys for you, then, then, then try and use them rather than using one that's basically been given to you from, from the client. Because um, unfortunately, we're, I think we're finding across the industry that R&D surveys aren't as good as they should do. Um, and, um, you know, they, they should be obstructive. They should go into all those inside of the building fabric as much as possible. Um, so, yes, check the scope of works, try and get involved early and, and do as much due diligence as you can. Yeah, and it's it's matching that survey, isn't it, to the yeah. actual work that's going to be undertaken. And I ask my teams, um, so a part of the construction phase plan that we get together, I always ask them the question in there, have you matched the scope of works, you know, to, to the asbestos survey? So it basically, it, it prompts them to go back and, and check it and, and that the, they will get it flung back at them if they haven't. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. And, and Liam, coming back to um, yourself again. Um, Alison Harvey has said, I think a lot of importance needs to be put on to how asbestos information is presented to tradespeople um, and not just, and, and I think this is a great question about communication. You know, we reading a survey can be quite difficult. So, and, and surveys, although, you know, it's very regulated area, also, you know, surveys are all different. Um, so, Liam, from your perspective, what's the best way to give information to tradespeople around this in a way that they can understand? Um, I don't want to use the word, but I use it quite often, but it needs to be sort of idiot proof. Because um, we all we all understand things at different levels in different ways. So um, it should be like... It, to me, the asbestos ready, the, you know, the information given when you go in onto a site, that should be your Bible. Um, and it should be, it should be explained so everybody can understand it and everybody, you know, whether it's through, um, whether it's through uh, plans and it's just highlighted on like a, a bit of a, on a drawing. It, it don't necessarily have, don't necessarily, because there's a lot of surveys and, and, uh, that I've that I have to come across and um, registers. It it's, there's a, it seems to be like a lot of jargon in there, um, and then you sign it, say that you've read it, and that that sort of them covering their bum. Unfortunately, it's not. You know, you've got to be phys for me personally. You've got to be physically shown, so. On your site induction, everybody has to have a site induction. Uh, if it's a, a refurbishment, certainly a refurbishment construction site, and they they tell you exactly where that asbestos is, what you can and can't do, um, and it should it should be physically shown to you. I think that's the easiest way of doing it, um, and also it should be highlighted in if you've got multiple rooms, uh, uh, multiple story building, anything like a, re a refurbishment. It should be a sign. It should be signed, signed everywhere. You know, asbestos is present in, I don't know, boiler room one or something like. That. It should be just everywhere. Everything else is there. You know, they show everything else in your face, um, like wearing a hard hat on a roof. Um, so unless a pigeon or an airplane is going to fall on you, you're quite all right. But they chuck all that at you, but they don't. They, they, it's like it's brushed under the carpet. As long as we've got some in writing everything's fine and when we'll we'll get along with it so if you but going back it would be everything should be signed um and everything should be shown physically and i think that that just make a lot of people understand um where and how it can be found i think that's great advice and and also it's you know we know from cases it's not just the people that are of, of you know involved in that so it could be that you know other occupiers need to have that information as well in a really good way that they can understand so yeah thanks for that 
Um, Archie, coming back to yourself again, I'm really conscious of time. There's some amazing questions in the chat box, and I'm sorry if we haven't got to your question. Um, but Archie, there's quite a few questions in the chat box around responsibilities. Um, so there's been a few questions around who is responsible within the school. So is it um, the local authority or is it a trust responsibility? Um, and also in respect of buildings, you might have a, um, you know, you might have a managing agent, you might have a landlord, you've got occupiers. Um, so can you just give us a little bit of information to um, for those people that are listening around responsibility? Okay, so there are a variety of people who have responsibilities. It won't come down to a, a single person. And at the point I made before is at the front line, workers have to take a responsibility. Liam made a very good point that workers not only risk themselves, but others. But in terms of managing the building in general, it's the persons who own the building or the persons who have, and this is for Britain, uh, the persons who have the responsibility for maintenance. Now, you gave the example of schools. There are a great many different varieties of um, pro those who have responsibilities for the maintenance. So I can't give go through every scenario, but there's those who have responsibility for the building. If that's the contractual requirement, then they have a responsibility. Those who, Nat's point, those who are going on to take on the maintenance work, they have a responsibility as well. Those who are giving them the information, property owner, those responsible for the property maintenance um, and are commissioning the work. But those who are you know, in that scenario, if you're going to be going there and disrupting workforce to change the building, you have a responsibility to find out what's there. As best as one of many risks, it's a very important one, but you need to be providing the workforce with that information. So it's not a single person or group of people that have responsibility. And it's all of them, I think, we'd, just to be fair. If, you, if you're involved in any of those parties, you have a responsibility. And it's not by saying someone else has the responsibility doesn't mean that you avoid responsibility and shouldn't be taking action. All of those groups need to be taking action and they do should be checking across. So Liam's point is very right. If a worker themselves is not seeing a, a register as, as Liam described it or a survey, they need to be asking. Their managers and the businesses, as Nat pointed out, need to be looking and asking. And the property owners themselves should be looking and asking, where is this information I have about the asbestos in my property? Because just remember for those, those people instructing building changes, if the asbestos isn't removed, the asbestos work at the work on the, that area is done badly, they are left with that problem in their property. That's a much more expensive option to deal with, never mind the health and safety risks that it engenders. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Nat, um, Lorna Johns has said, I've spoken with young 18 year old building labourers willing to take the risk for a cash in hand payment. How do we deal with situations like that? And that kind of, you know, less so fair attitude. Of, I'm, going to go in and I'm just going to do it, whatever. Yes, very difficult. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, we, we, we often know that, uh, you know, young people, you know, take a, take a lot more risks. Um, and, um, you know, we don't just see it, you know, in, in you know, th this type of work, but, uh, a, a, you know, any risky work. Um, and, um, you know, it comes to be education. And that's where I think, you know, we, we need, you need to make sure that if you're, you know, who you're asking to undertake surveys and who you're asking to undertake asbestos removal, you know, is, um, basically got the right accreditations if they're doing licensed work then, then, then they are through a properly licensed company licensed in the UK through, through the HSE um, and um, that basically you know you you have a duty of care at the end of the day you know to, to ensure that you know if you do see you know this type of um, work happening on on your own sites and on your property you know you you have a duty of care as well so I, I would definitely say um, you know from where you have you know that influence trying to influence that as much as possible um and try you know, and use accredited companies um to do that work um for you and you know and for others it's, it's about education and which is why why we're doing this call today really uh, and somebody else mentioned i think you know well, why don't 
in in the um in the, in the chat box about why don't we educate you know people in in schools and, and that about asbestos at an earlier age because people only really tend to find out much more about it if they say join the automotive or construction industries and um by then it, it is probably too late um so you know it's something that we probably ought to do and that's why you know it's really encouraging to see the hse uh partnering with you know people like um, on the tools um, because we you know the, these are sites and places where you know young people uh, do visit they have a massive influence um, and I believe you know with a campaign that we are doing today you know with it being detailed on the tools is getting the message out there um, so people can learn a little bit more because um, you know it is still endemic you know in all our buildings you know and everybody you know will be at some point you know very close to it and you just have to be aware of the dangers it can pose um for your long-term health yeah no thanks and i i'm sorry if we haven't re I, i've got well over 100 questions in the chat box and there's some really excellent questions in there um and, and I'm sorry if we, we haven't reached your question, but we're, we're coming towards the end of the session now. Um, so I'm going to um, just come to our panellists one last time um, and starting with yourself, um, Liam, if you could just give us a really short kind of one minute, you know, takeaway for those on the call today. <laughs> um that might help to manage this risk um short and sweet of it um i would assume me personally if you are in the construction uh, industry i would assume that everything within within the age um contains and i wouldn't i wouldn't do anything until i've seen that register or a, a, a certainly a, a, an in-depth survey of the property um and only then would i be going anywhere near that building because like i've said before you're not just putting yourself at risk you're putting everybody around you at risk and i'm living breathing proof of it so um that's where i'd yeah that's what really what i you know, yeah so so look at the survey and don't feel uncomfortable about asking and ask, ask questions there's no such yeah as people keep telling me there's no such thing as a daft question so just ask questions until you until you understand and don't don't stop asking questions until you're confident that you understand the survey you understand what you know all the risks involved excellent and archie same same to you quick fire you know takeaway for for those listening today thanks louise and um, yes i'd agree with liam I think the big thing is remember asbestos is still a significant risk. I think the point about people not perceiving a risk, young people prepared to take the risk, we have to show that it is still a risk. We have to inform them, find out about it, make sure that they and anyone working on it is, are trained. If you want to find information, I have to say we have acres of web pages with information. If you want to find out what asbestos looks like in all sorts of forms that it was made into, please do visit our web pages. The campaign information is shorter and sweet. Um, and take action, avoid it. You know, this, this is your health, it is not somebody else. And if we wanna take action, we need to turn it into a culture like we did with, hel uh, with safety helmets where it was somewhat, people didn't. And now asking for a survey should be, and avoiding as best, it should be seen as same, the same part of construction culture is that it's pretty reasonable as Liam says, to say no, this isn't reasonable. We shouldn't be working in this. We don't know what this material is. And I've had training that shows me that that's where there's a risk. Yeah, and, and, and I would say that. I don't know if somebody in the background could just put a link to the asbestos page on the HSC. And um, also the No Time to Lose campaign has got some phenomenal resources. Um, and and I and I will refer backwards and forwards to those as well. So um, do access those resources; they're all free. So um, go and have a look. Um, Nat, 
um, your final takeaway? Okay, we're really just going to say uh, very similar. It's Global Asbestos Awareness Week. You know, thank you for everybody, you know, joining the call. It's all about awareness, you know, and the Asbestos and You campaign and the HSC and the IOSH No Time to Lose campaign. Go out there and, you know, find out more about it and just, you know, read up a little bit more. It's all about that awareness. The more you're aware, the more you can make mothers aware. And that's really important. Excellent. Well, thank you. And there you have it. Yeah, another hour flies by. Um, and I hope that you've found that a valuable hour to spend. Um, so hopefully you've had some great um, take homes from the panel. Um, in terms of my takeout that I'll leave you with from my own experience um, is, you know, there's a lot of guidance out there. Um, which the HSE and IOSH have made freely available. So my takeaway would be to use that information, follow the duty of care, allocate the resources that you need to to, to, to fulfil your obligations um, and communicate really well and really clearly to everyone who could be affected. So um, that is the end of the session. Um, thank you to our panellists and thank you to everybody on the call. We've had a great response to this session today. I wish you a very pleasant rest of the day. Um, take care and goodbye.